From the Law School of St. Louis University, HECTV and the Missouri Bar Association proudly present a mini law school. Tonight, Sarah Pleban and Diane Monahan discuss what family law is all about. She practices in the area of guardian ad litem work in domestic cases. And then she's splitting her time with Diana Monahan, who is in her office, you share offices together, who's also a solo practitioner. Um, she is currently one of two permanent guardian ad litems, or GALs is what we refer them to them as, that handle child order protection cases in St. Louis County. She's also a graduate of St. Louis University School of Law. So uh, you guys will take questions. We'll probably stop a little bit early, depending upon how many questions you have, so you can have questions at the end. And please repeat the questions. My name is Sarah Pleban, as Nancy said, and uh, what I, Nancy was, took me home for dinner, like the first week of law school, and I was in this dorm across the street, which now is fancy. The, the dorm was really, really awful, and Nancy took me home, and so I felt like a real person again when I was starting law school. Um, and then Leo and I connected then again when our kids were little and we were, had kids in the cry room at church. So, you know, I've gone from being a public defender to I went into private practice, and now what I do almost exclusively is work as a guardian ad litem, and I represent children in custody cases. They're in divorce cases, domestic cases. Um, sometimes I will travel down to juvenile court in neglect and abuse cases. I used to do that. I was one of a mom retainer like Diane is now, but I don't do that anymore. So when you are the guardian ad litem, how do you get that position? Either the court appoints you, and the court has to appoint you if a parent alleges abuse or neglect. So there's a statute that kicks in, or if they just want some help in deciding custody. And what I have seen over the years as this has evolved is that more and more cases we just use a guardian ad litem. So I am the attorney for the child, and, and I look out for the best interests of the child. The thing that sets me apart from an attorney representing a parent is that that attorney has to do what that client wants. It may be a wacky course of action, like I, I want to go for all of her money. You know, I want her to pay me maintenance. Might be kind of a wacky little road that they're going on, but they have to do it. What I do is I have to do what I think is in the child's best interest. So occasionally you will have a child that'll say, I want to go with this or that parent, and, and I'm, I look and see what's going on. It might not be in the child's best interest to spend all their time there. I will always tell the court what the child's wishes are, but ultimately what I recommend is in the child's best interest. So I represent the child in all the legal proceedings, and, and normally what I do is I interview mom, I interview dad, I talk with the children, and then there might be a variety of other people who are involved in this family's life therapists, they're a very good source for me. Teachers are a good source. Um, like, uh, friends and relatives aren't usually quite such a good source because that, that's just kind of the biased one generation removed, and I already get it. All right, um, let me backtrack just a little bit. How, I forgot how I get appointed. So, you know, you get appointed by statute, the court will appoint you because there's abuse or neglect, or the parent's attorney say we would like a guardian ad litem. And now, uh, sometimes the judge will pick a, a GAL, but a lot of times, and you probably find this too, Diane does a lot of GAL work. The attorneys agree on who it is. I want Sarah Pleban as the GAL, we agree. Um, if the court appoints a, a, a GAL, each party can take one change from that guardian. You know, so you ha there's a time limit, but they say, I, you know, I just do not like Sarah Pleban. I had her on my divorce, and I don't like what she did, and now I'm on a motion to modify, and she's not going to like me again. I want to change her, and then the other side gets to pick the guardian. So what I do then, I'm, I'm interviewing everybody, and what am I looking for? When you go to the statute, the statute says, the General Assembly has found it to be in the children's best interest that each child have frequent and meaningful contact with both parents. 
and that it is best for children if parents can make decisions together about uh, this child. Now that seems to make common sense and it seems very simple and it seems like we could go into court and you know they have two parents who love their their child and we could just yeah this is what we ought to do well it doesn't happen that way so many times and I guess because of that we have jobs but um, we help people find a solution to their custody issues I gave you a handout which shows you maybe three or four or five different parenting plans parenting plans now I was talking with Carol, Carol Stiles here and, and she said boy this seems so complicated there are so many you know clauses for this and that and the rules and the regulations and there are and that's what people fall back on if they can't agree then here's how we do this now even when it says here's how we do this of course not everybody obeys not everybody does what they they say they'll do so you have custody is divided into two big areas one is legal custody and one is physical custody and you will see in the plans that I put in that it, it's outlined like that and and the physical custody is where does Tommy go on this day of the week where does Tommy go on the weekends where does he go how are we going to split up the holidays how do we exchange him um, how do we uh, tell each other if there's a change in plans how do we have telephone contact with them what do we do if we want to take Tommy out of town um, Things have, you know, I've, I've been doing this for quite a while, and I think maybe when I first started in 89, typically mom's got most of the custody, and dad had every other weekend and maybe one night during the week. And that has really switched, and what we see is that we try to give kids as much contact with each parent as possible. You balance that with how many exchanges can the child handle. Kids at different age do better, um, like settling in for a long time. As kids get older, they want their school books in one place. They want to sit in with that one parent and, and you know, kind of nestle in. And so then you maybe do longer blocks with each parent. When you got these little bitty guys, they need, they need frequent contact with each parent. You know, I, I've had cases where, I've had a case where uh, a father filed suit for paternity before the baby was born, but he knew mom wasn't going to let him have anything to do with that baby so now I've got a newborn that I'm trying to make a parenting plan with and um, not ideal but sometimes when they're real little they just get used to going back and forth and didn't have you know the parents in the home um, parenting plans look different for different ages as I said with the little bitty ones with the babies we start we make sure that it, and I'm not I'm not meaning to say this and in, in, um, have you think that I'm sexist sexist but typically infants are with mom more than dad I mean that's just how it is that's the lay of the land we get there and I've got you know this is how we do it but we want to make sure that this baby is with dad frequently dad has to have the bond with the baby just as much as mom and because parents split up we still have to work on that um, as kids get older they can spend longer periods of time away from one parent or the other so for a three-year-old two days at a time away from mom or dad is okay may not be okay when they're six months old you know they're they just forget um, as they get older teens a lot of teens would say can I just be week to week with my mom and dad I want to be with my parents equally but I like to settle in and that's a that's a pretty good plan when you get to have teens um, when I do week to week custody I like a midweek break to see the other parent because I still think that seven days is a long time to go without seeing the other parent um, what I try to do is get parents what is it that works for you what are your work schedules you know I have one mom right now who's working four midnight shifts she's got somebody who's in but she's letting her three-year-old kind of play during the day while she takes a nap and that and, and they live 90 minutes apart and and I'm trying to figure out how can I place this three-year-old so that he's with dad on the days that mom works and vice versa I like to minimize daycare and maximize uh, parental contact All right. 
Um, you then, then the other one is joint legal custody. And that means who makes the decisions on issues such as education, religion, um, medical, um, uh, summer camps, activities, that sort of thing. Now what do we want? We want parents to make decisions together. I mean, that, that, that's a real easy one. What do we frequently have? Parents who can't agree on what day of the week it is. So you can do things like, let's get some help in here. Let's see if we can't get you with a counselor so that you all are talking productively, nicely to each other, and help you learn to make joint decisions. It's not that difficult if you put aside your own issues. Um, the law says that a judge must consider joint custody. He or she does not have to do it, but has to consider it. And on the flip side, if the parents cannot communicate and make joint decisions, it is error for the court to give joint legal custody. That's different than joint physical custody. You can still have the kids with each parent 50% of the time. But if you cannot work together, you can't have joint legal custody. If you go in there and into court in a trial and say, um, I think I can, I think we will, you know, once you all get out, I think we can do it. Won't work. Can't have joint legal custody. So then the court will look at, or I, you know, I make a recommendation to the judge as to what I think is in the best interest, and I hand in one of these parenting plans. And then I look at each parent, and there are factors. Which parent is most likely to include the other one? Even if you get to make the final decision, which parent is going to get the input? Which one is more likely to shut the other person out? Which one has better decision-making abilities for certain areas? Some children have special needs. For instance, maybe education is a deal. You have a child with a learning disability. Which parent is more involved? Which parent can handle the information? Which parent will make really good decisions for the child? Um, when you look at kids' needs, you look at that when you place them with parents. Sometimes physical needs make it difficult for one parent or another. Sometimes emotional needs. Um, we, have, we get real challenges then when we come in with parents with special needs. And I, I call that maybe like alcohol and drug usage that are their special needs. You have, you have a, a certainly a, a relatively good percentage of people who have chemical dependency and alcohol issues. Mm -hmm. So then what do we do? We have to make sure that child's safe. Uh, if you have a parent who's um, alcohol dependent or using chemicals, we typically get supervised visits. So there are various supervisors. There's somebody in the courthouse. Uh, there are paid supervisors who are $40 an hour. And then there are maybe family and friends that you try to go to to make sure that that child is safe. You try and put in programs that a parent needs to do to make sure that they get themselves or to help them get themselves to a level where they can better parent. Because it's, pr it's pretty hard to be child-centered when you are abusing alcohol or using drugs. Um, we have parents with um, emotional needs that make it difficult to parent. Um, you, if you have a parent who's been diagnosed, I mean, I've, I've had schizophrenic parents. And um, that, that one is pretty tough. You know, a lot of times you, you have medication issues. Uh, bipolar is um, a diagnosis that I think we're seeing more and more in our society, and that can be managed, but a lot of times um, people are not med compliant. They don't do their treatment. So you got to make sure that if a parent has an emotional um, disability, are they treating it, and are they on top, and how can we monitor this? We now have things like, it's called a scram bracelet. You put it on, on your um, ankle, and it measures alcohol. And once a day, you call in, and it gives a reading. And they first started using that at work release program, but it is just really great for cases where a parent says, I'm now sober, and nobody has a lot of faith in that. Um, and, and it is great. It costs about, I think it's about $100 to install it, and then $30 a day. And then, yeah, it's expensive. But, you know, I, I just had a case where a, a dad had been an alcoholic for a long time, had done sober by the sea, you know, a lot of treatment programs, and he comes to me and he's, I am, 
I am sober. And he had all the earmarks of being sober, but I said, you understand why your soon-to-be ex-wife doesn't trust this. You know, that, that's what happens. I said, hey, let's get a scram bracelet. And he said, okay. You know, and after four months, we took that scram bracelet off. Another thing that's good for parents with uh, alcohol issues is an interlock device. You have to blow into it to start your car. And uh, then the report comes to me as the GAL, or you know, you can set up various people. So we have some of those helps for us. Um, you need to look, when a court is making a decision, when I'm making a recommendation, I, w I really look for child-centered parents. We hear all the time about parents' rights. I have the right to, to joint custody. I have the right. What I try to reframe for parents is you really don't have rights. You have responsibilities. Once you have this child, you have a responsibility. Your child has the right. Your child has a right to a relationship with both parents. Your child has a right to conflict-free exchanges. All the rights belong to your child, and you have the responsibility to see that. You know, and sometimes that'll take them aback and, and we can get ourselves back on track. Um, once you get your divorce decree with custody, and Diane's going to talk to you probably what you want to hear more of, and that is how you go about this divorce, um, you can come back later and modify it. And when you modify it, there's, there's this little buzz language that says Circumstance of ha circumstances have changed in such a substantial and continuing nature to make the original terms unreasonable. Okay. So things have got to have changed in a major way so that it's not reasonable. So you look at this parenting plan that I have and maybe it was a time when mom was working nights and dad had most of the custody. Now mom is a nurse working daytime, and a custody is, is much different, and she can have custody on different times. Um, another, time, another occasion might be we have a parent who's chemically dependent who then finds themselves clean and sober for a year or whatever it is. That's different. I need to come back into court. When you have supervised visits, you have to prove that um, unsupervised might impair the child's emotional health <coughs> or put them at risk physically. And then to come back, the, uh, the parent has to prove that that circumstance no longer exists. They have rehabilitated themselves, whatever caused it to be at that level, and that unsupervised is now warranted. Um, kids in court. My opinion is kids should not be in court. You know. Uh, it, it, is, it is not a nice place for adults to be, for pity's sake. It's a really bad idea to bring children in. And what that does, kids are not in charge. They do not get to decide where they live. That's another thing. A lot of people think that when they're a certain age, uh, 14, 15, 16, they get to decide custody. And they don't. And the reason, I think, is twofold. One, it puts that child in the middle. It makes the kid the bad guy to say, I want to live five days with uh, mom and two days with dad. They have to hurt somebody's feelings. And the second reason is, if you turn over that kind of power to a child, open the door. What is more important? Then that child should be able to tell you what their curfew is, who they're going to see, how when they're going to drive that car. These are adult decisions. You need to listen to children. You need to, to figure out what is going on. Why are they saying, this is where I'm comfortable, this is what I want to do, but they aren't in charge. Um, it, it is seldom that I get information from children that I can't figure out by the adults talking. You know, or, and, and the adults, I'm talking about mom and dad and the teachers and the doctors and that sort of thing. Um, they can verify information for me, but for the most part, they do not deserve to be dragged into court. And um, w when a parent does that, it usually comes back to haunt them. You know, because it's not child-centered to make your kid go through it. There are exceptions. So I'm not telling you that a child never testifies. I mean, there are some times. Um, and we, we can protect children a little bit. Uh, when they come in to testify, we can ask that the parents leave. And that is sometimes helpful. But the parents get the information. They're entitled to that. They have a right to the information and testimony that was presented. So the child isn't that insulated. Uh, she may be insulated from 
facing mom or dad right there, but when they go home, that's mom or dad's going to know what happened. Um, I don't know if you have any questions now on custody, and then and then I'll stop at the half point, and you can get yours. What your May I ask, at what legal age is the child? Uh, I, child support goes until they are 21, and, and so if you when we do custody, uh, when we're doing physical custody, um, I've done it for college kids. The reality is, when you have a, a child in college, the plan isn't going to look anything like this. It's probably just going to be as the parents and the children agree. Kids go back and forth, but um, you know if, if you have. I don't know that I've had an original divorce where parents fight over an 18 or 19 year old on the physical custody after high school. They will fight on child support. So usually I, I just do the plan, it, it, it's between the parent and the child. Yes, I would just, would your role be not an officer of the court, but like a moderator uh, in between? Is that a, a good explanation? You don't seem like, oh. you don't have the power of, a, of the court because you're not officer of the court, are you? I, that question is, am I an officer of the court, am I a moderator? That's a very good question. I am an arm of the court. The, the, the case law comes out that I am neutral and I'm biased and an arm of the court. And the reality is that most, Linda will, will, has been in, in this role, she's in the courthouse. The reality is most judges listen to the GAL. And what the GAL <laughs> recommends is usually what goes on because I am a neutral party and I have seen both sides. And what happens is the judge gets just, you know, I get kind of a snapshot of people's lives. The judge gets the negatives, you know, so I'm going to know more and have some of the nuances. Um, I am not a mediator. To be a mediator, you have to have specialized training and it, it takes a while. But in effect, I, I think moderate is probably a very good word. I try to get parents to come to a middle. It may not be what each one wants individually, but it's, most times it's better for a child if we can agree on something rather than we fight this out because parents get so angry when this dirty laundry is aired in public, it, it goes down to the child. But I try, you know, like, here, can we give there? Here, can we give there? You know, I, I do some of that, but not, and when I'm in court, I am just another lawyer. So, you know, I cross-examine, I call witnesses, I have my exhibits and that sort of thing. Uh, right, it's cool. Who pays the bills? Who pays the bills? Well, unfortunately, a lot of times nobody's paying that bill. You know, that's a... <laughs> uh, uh, the mom and dad are ordered to pay my fees. And um, it, it's, an inter it's an interesting thing because we end up making less money than um, attorneys for parents. And there, there's several reasons, and one is, if I'm an attorney for a parent and you aren't honoring your contract with me in agreement, I get out. I am drafted, and you know, I'm serving my country admirably through start to stop with that case, regardless of whether I've gotten a penny. In the end, I will get a judgment against uh, mom or dad, or usually both. And then I can collect on that from uh, real estate, <coughs> excuse me, cars, I can garnish wages, and you know what I tell parents when they come in is I, I need to make a living. I have children of my own. But what I really think would be smart is for you to save your money and use it on your own children. And that means you and dad or you and mom have to agree. But if you can't, I'm here and I'm going to make money because every time I do something, it costs you. Yes, sir. As an interpreter working for the courts, I mean, um I've been uh, participating in some uh, child custody cases. Uh, one of them, um, there was uh, this couple that they each, each of them, every time they met with, you know, with a person like you and the personal lawyers, they always say that the, uh, the kid, the best interest for the kid was to be with them, you know, with each. Right. I mean, you know, they tried to get a full custody. <laughs> but uh, they were coaching the kid. Now, it is possible <coughs> for the court to allow visual evidence like recordings or video or video you know uh, stuff like that to see what the kid really thinks about which father is the one that they want to stay especially when they are a little bit older seven eight years old this gentleman is asking that oftentimes it it looks like parents are coaching the child to say this or that and can you get visual recordings uh, um, the answer is is possibly if you are talking about a parent maybe just sets up a recorder and you know the, the child doesn't know 
um, maybe it, it's how you get that evidence in. I, I can't say it exactly. If you're talking about maybe a psychologist interviewing the child, you know, you probably have the psychologist there. Uh, here is one thing that, that uh, hopefully none of you are ever in this situation, but I'll just bring it up. When telephone conversations being recorded, one party has to consent to the recording. So if I call you, I can record you. You don't have to know it because I consented. If, are you telling me something now? Just in Missouri. In Missouri, yeah, don't go into Illinois and do this. You're in big old trouble. Uh, <coughs> say nothing of Texas. Uh, uh, it, if you have, if my child is on the phone with you, I may not record that and not let you know, okay? So you can't record your, have your, the, the telephone conversations between mom and child recorded unless mom knows they're being recorded. And it's amazing, a lot of times I get people to communicate via email because it, it's, first of all, I tell them you have the ability to sit back before you hit that send button and to moderate what you say. And, and it's amazing to me what people will say and they know it's going to me. And I was like, wow. That was, whew, and it's going to go into the court eventually. But it gives me a, a, a real idea of what a parent is like. Yes, does Carol? Does a judge or does someone initially say, we think this couple needs you? I mean, how do you get involved to begin with? I, mean, I, I get involved to begin with. If in the, the petition for divorce that Diane will talk about, they say that mom has abused or neglected, if they used either one of those words, automatically I get one. But what happens is most of the time attorneys will just say, I would like, they, they make a motion for a GAL. And over the years that I've done this, I have seen that in cases where custody is going to be an issue, the attorneys usually just want a GAL. And uh, I think sometimes it's easier to deflect off to me um, what I'm doing, what, what is happening with custody. And you know, I think most attorneys are pretty good about this, and it's just, it, it's a better way. I am a neutral person. You know, I, I don't, I'm not on mom's side. I'm not on dad's side. I'm just on the child's side. And if I'm an attorney for a parent, I don't really see the other side. I've got my client. I've got my bias. When I'm the GAL, I see both of them. And, you know, I see the lumps under both the rugs. You know, I see the good and the bad. So... <coughs> Holidays are a real tough time for a GAL. You know, it, it's, you know, Easter will send us over the edge. You know, is it 8 o'clock? Is it 8.30? You know, who's hiding those, who's telling about the Easter Bunny? It's just a mess. Yes, ma'am. How do you differ from a court-appointed special advocate, The statute, uh, I think the statute says that either a GAL or a CASA can be appointed. And in, uh, the CASAs are, are members of the community who take training and they are advocates for children, court-appointed special advocates. In the St. Louis County, we do not have CASAs representing any kids in divorces or paternity cases. Even in the juvenile court, when kids are charged, or kids are the subject of abuse or neglect, you may have a CASA, but you also have a GAL for the child. I think in the city of St. Louis, down in juvenile court, they sometimes have CASA and not a GAL. And I, I, I don't know if it's just by custom or practice. And when I did stuff in juvenile court, I loved having a CASA on my case because it got, it got some extra attention for that child and, and could really <coughs> dig in because that CASA member had one child. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think I, I want um, a CASA worker being the legal representative because I think it's not a fair playing field if mom and dad have attorneys. I mean, it's, it's just hard when you don't know the law, it's hard to get in there and, and do that same stuff. Yes, sir. When the divorce is final and you've got one of the participants using the parental parenting plan, uh, how much evidence do you need to really go back and have something done? And what would the court really do to that person? This gentleman wants to know if you have a parent who's not following the parenting plan, what can you do? What can you go back into court and what will court do? There are a couple of different vehicles that you can use. One is a, called a family access motion. That is the easiest thing for a parent to do. 
and you can go in and on your own, you can <coughs> file it, and it says that you have been denied your custody rights, and you ask for compensatory time, uh, you can ask for counseling, you know, you can ask for different exchanges. Um, there are some time frames that that has to be heard, and it's a relatively quick one. I think it's within 60 days. Do you know the time? I'm not sure, but it's the it, quickest. It's the quickest way. I think it's like within 60 days. Now, what happens when you do that? You know, if you go in because one day has been missed, nothing's, it, you know, it's not going to happen. If it's a pattern, then you can get some makeup time. When you have a parent who is routinely disregarding, then probably there are two vehicles there. That would be a motion for contempt because they have failed to follow this court order. And the, uh, you can have somebody thrown in jail for that. It happens rarely on the custody that you're thrown in jail for that. You can get fines. You can get, sometimes it's just, I'll behave now. You know, you get somebody behaving. And the other one is a motion for, uh, to modify the, the terms of the original decree. If you, and I see this frequently, with a parent was fairly content to have every other weekend and Wednesday night until the parents started messing with that and they don't get it. And then that parent says, I want full custody. I'm never gonna have my child if I don't have full custody. So what, what is the court? I mean, the court looks at when a parent is fooling around with this and denying visitation, you know, that's pretty serious. But that, then you get into, yeah, it's because she's doing this, he's doing that, you know, it gets pretty dirty, but it is serious. You're supposed to follow that. And all the parenting plans, it'll say, custody is, the, as, is as the parents agree. But if they don't agree, here's where we go. Sometimes it's hard to enforce with the police because you have to backtrack. Alternate weekends. Well, this decree was entered in uh, April of 2005, and we are now here in April of 2009. Whose weekend is it? You have to get that calendar out from 2005 and plug it in and plug in the holidays and how that switched. <coughs> okay, any more? And then I'm going to turn this over to Diane. Well, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, in cases where the parents are not married, mm -hmm. do you, are you called in on those kind of cases? Yes. Well? Those are, he wants to know if I'm a, a, as a GAL, am I called in on paternity cases? And yes, I am. And, and probably my most difficult one right now is where mom and dad were just dating in San Francisco, and then the mom gets pregnant. They met on the internet. They hadn't dated very much. Mom says to dad, I want you to take your profile off. Okay. And we're going to co-parent. Okay. Here's the furniture I want you to buy. So it's the same. Okay. Both wildly <coughs> successful. You know, making, dad's making a million, mom's making 500,000. Then at about when mom was maybe seven months pregnant, Dad makes it clear, we aren't going to be a, a family. We will co-parent. Mom says, don't like this. When the baby was two months old, in the middle of the night, she moved to St. Louis. Didn't tell him. Told him, I'm busy. You can't come over today. And she transferred her job here because they had a company. And so now I've got this little baby who is shuttling back and forth from San Francisco to here. And mom, certainly, you know, with, with little babies, as I said before, uh, mothers will have the upper hand for a little while, but not always. I mean, and her decisions certainly were not based with her child in mind, and she's, you know, continues to do that. So, but I've got now this little guy who's going to have to shuttle himself back and forth for the rest of his life. All right, one last one. If I Is there any way to mandate some kind of... Uh, court ordered or, or something uh, testing for alcohol abuse can we mandate court order testing for alcohol abuse you can go you can <coughs> um, make a motion in court for alcohol for alcohol testing and sometimes what we'll do I just had one today as I was driving down here I called my office and left a message because I have the ability to ask this mom to, to have a, uh, a urine <coughs> test and so my message to myself was you know call this person tomorrow and tell them to go take a test uh, sometimes into the plans I built in, I build in drug tests, but more, a lot of it's hair follicle, which will go back 90 days. Um, sometimes it's a combination of hair follicle and urine. Urine picks up immediate use. Hair follicle takes repeated and long-term use. Okay, not, whoop. Is that with, does there have to be any kind of history of it? Yeah, you, you just can't go in and say, I think. But, you know, a lot of times the level isn't that high. I mean, if I have reason to believe 
uh, the court will probably err on the side of granting that test. Okay, thank you. Okay, my name is Diane Monahan, and I share office space with Sarah. We're not partners, and actually, we first met probably about 12 years ago when we were opposing counsel. She represented Dad, I represented Mom, and we both kind of lost, didn't we? <laughs> Big time. <laughs> but we're friends, so that, that worked out well. Because I'm going to go into the divorce aspect, I'm going to be pretty general and pretty much reserve the, you know, for questionings, but I'll go through the process. First of all, somebody has to file for divorce in order to get divorced, or somebody has to file for custody to get custody. And so whoever it is, mom or dad or husband or wife, you go down to the courthouse. Hopefully, actually, you retain a lawyer because that's probably the most efficient way to do it. Uh, file your papers within this very generic pleading. You indicate uh, things that give the court jurisdiction or uh, venue. For example, I live in the city and my husband lives in the county. I want to file for divorce. I could pretty much pick do I want to file in St. Louis County or St. Louis City. It's got to be where one of the parties resides. If I have children and I have moved in from another state, the court cannot determine jurisdiction or take jurisdiction for custody purposes unless those children have been within the state of Missouri for six months. So when you have somebody running from one state to another, there's a, a, there's a benchmark period of time that those kids actually have to reside there before the state of Missouri can take jurisdiction. Also within those uh, pleadings, you probably want to indicate what you want for custody and why uh, when you married. Just really, you know, generic things. You cannot, and this is also pled in your filings, you cannot be pregnant and be granted a divorce while you are pregnant. So if you are, you have to indicate and swear under oath that you are not pregnant. And if in fact you are, and this comes out while the proceedings are going on, the court will delay the divorce until you're pregnant because you have to make a determination as to who the parent is or who the father is of the, the child. Uh, basically, once you file your uh, petition, that's when you get assigned whoever the judge may be. And this is probably a very critical aspect, which is why you should probably have an attorney filing for you. Because it's stamped in, it's supposed to be random, a random assignment, and whoever is stamped on there is going to be your judge. And you have just a period of time where if you don't want that judge on your case, you can disqualify that judge. There's certain, you know, certain things like you can't have any hearings in front of them first and then decide you don't like them. But there's a period of time, and if you don't take advantage of it in that period of time, you lose the opportunity. So, uh, so that's like the first most important thing to happen is the stamping in of your petition. Then there's that period of time uh, where you try to get the other side served and then they have 30 days to answer. Divorce takes a long time, six months on the short end and a year or more on the upper end. And there are basically five components in a divorce. Number one being custody, which Sarah already discussed. Uh, there's also child support that goes along with that custody, maintenance, property and debt division, and then attorney's fees. And um, basically, as far as custody goes, depending on how the custody turns out, who will be getting child support, there's a very simple Form 14 that the courts fill out based on everybody's gross incomes. And then there are things factored in, such as child care expenses, uh, health insurance costs, and then you, you actually literally pick off the back of a chart the number uh, per month for the amount of children. I've got, I've got a sample of one up here. You know, you can look at it. But, uh, and then there's a credit on the bottom for visitation. So if one person is paying the child support to the other, then they get a credit for the uh, numbers of overnights or amount of time they spend with the child. It's pretty black and white, although there are, there are some issues if you're self-employed, for example, or if you uh, get a lot of commission work, then they may average your income over a period of time. It's really up to the judge to determine what number is going to go up in that gross income line. Um, the way that everybody gets the information about your financials is when you're first filing your petition, uh, you also have to file 
a statement of income and expenses, and a statement of property, which is a real pain in the neck, but you have to fill out all of your monthly expenses for everything, recreation, food, clothing, health care, insurance, uh, house payment, car payments, everything you can possibly think of goes on there. Uh, your, um, the property that you hold, your houses, your cars, your bank accounts, any trust accounts, all that information is filed in the public court file, FYI, for a divorce, maybe not on a custody because those are pretty much closed files. Um, paternity. Right, paternity or, and or custody. Um, when I say know your judge, it's really critical because that judge is going to be the one making the decision on all those factors that we talked about. And for example, if it gets to the point of maintenance, you may go into one judge and you're going to say, I know I'm not getting anything, you know, give it up. That's, that's why you have to know your case and your judge right at the beginning. Uh, other judges have a 10-year benchmark. You have to be married for 10 years, for example. This is not written in stone. This is not in a statute. Okay, the, the judge makes a determination based on many, many factors, but many of these judges have their own rules. So some may say, well, you know, what's your ability to earn? What's your earnings history? Uh, and typically, if you don't come to a settlement on that, which most cases do, by the way, but if you don't come to a settlement on the maintenance amount, it is typically entered as an indefinite <coughs> period of time, and that leaves it incumbent on the parties to come back and get that changed in the future. The reason that it's written that way is because the judge really would have difficulty saying, I believe in five years mom is going to be capable of earning enough money to meet her reasonable needs. He's got to know or she's got to know that that's going to happen in order to enter a maintenance order that has an end date to it, unless it's by agreement, okay? And then you'd say, well, why would anybody want to settle then, you know? If I was getting maintenance and it was open-ended, why would I want to settle? Well, sometimes, uh, you know, that maintenance amount might be small and the other side says, well, look, I'll, I'll, you know, beef it up a little, but I'll cut it off after four years. And it may really be worth it to settle on, on that, um, in that respect. The other thing that the judge is going to determine is the property and debt distribution. And more and more the courts are going to 50-50. I mean, everybody wants to come in and tell me how their husband was sleeping with five different people and then, of course, I find out from, you know, dad's attorney that mom only slept with four, but, you know. <laughs> but, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going back and forth. You know, he was no good, he was lazy, he didn't mow the lawn. And really what it boils down to is it's going to be split in half unless there's some <laughs> egregious behavior. And yes, having an affair is probably egregious, but not quite egregious enough. It's usually got to be somebody who, maybe if he's got a girlfriend, he's jet-setting her around and spending your money on that woman and in great amounts. That would be a consideration where the shift might be uh, to a 55-45, for example. Or we have domestic violence. Or we have somebody who is totally gambling away marital assets, uh, drinking away marital assets, uh, a really bad drug addict, something like that might push the number over, but I can tell you that it doesn't happen that often, and it also depends on the particular judge. There's some judges out there that pretty much are going to cut everything right down the middle no matter what. That also factors in with the maintenance because depending on where you ship those debts, um, you know, they may, may give you a higher number of maintenance if you're going to be taking on X amount of debts. And maintenance itself is based on just that, your reasonable needs. What do I have to pay off with this money? How much can I contribute out of my own money uh, before getting contribution from the other spouse? The other spouse not only will be paying you maintenance based on your special needs or your reasonable needs, excuse me, but also whether or not that person can meet his or her own reasonable needs first. And then whatever's left over, if, you know, if there's enough there to go toward the receiving spouse's uh, reasonable needs, it will definitely go over to that receiving spouse. With regard to the attorney's fees, 
That too is getting more and more away from, uh, hey, he's going to cover all my attorney's fees. Although the court does consider basically who is at fault here, you know, and I kind of use that word, you know, broadly because it's hard to just say the fault all lies on one person. Who's had the worst behavior? Who has more money? In some cases, we have a spouse that is unemployed, not because they don't feel like working, but because that was agreed to by the parties all along, and therefore they don't have the cash reserves to pay attorney's fees. So the court can, in fact, order, just based on financial reasons, that, that the other side pay attorney's fees and guardian fees as well. Um, and basically, that's it in a nutshell as far as divorce from beginning to end. You can come back and modify. Again, you have to show just what Sarah said, a change of circumstances. That goes for money, for more child support, for more maintenance or less maintenance. If I'm paying you $1,000 a month and suddenly this cush job that I had is no longer there and the economy is really bad and I really can't uh, get another job that would be the same or nearly the same, the court does consider downward um, motions, motions to take the maintenance downward. Child support is pretty black and white, but again, if, you're, if your income has changed and, and it's not just because you decided you're going to quit because you don't want to pay child support anymore, they definitely will consider that. But it's got to be a continuing change of circumstances. Uh, for example, if you're just going to have a reduced income for a couple of months, not only is it not worth you paying an attorney, you know, to pay an attorney to go in and try to get a change, but the court's not going to change it anyway. Uh, but the biggest factor in all of this, if there are kids, custody is the number one priority to the courts, and everything kind of builds off of that. Maintenance, child support, even the property, who gets to stay in the house, who has to move out. Um, but don't be fooled when you hear somebody say, for example, oh, so-and-so got the house, you know, because you, you're thinking in your mind that, well, they got this big asset and they get to keep it. Just picture in your mind a co two columns, his and hers, and it's going to balance out. So if that house has a net equity of 50000 and you get that house for 50000 the other person is going to get 50000 somewhere else, okay? And that's how they do the debts. Everything pretty much is going to end up being the same number bottom line. When I say it's split 50-50, I mean... I don't mean you necessarily sell the house and split the proceeds, but that the total assets and debts are then divided up 50-50. Does anybody have any questions? Diane, you mentioned that you can't get divorced when you have when you are pregnant. Right. Um, what is the law? I know it comes in on active duty personnel. On active duty personnel. Well, there is, a, you know what, it really depends on what they submit. There's actually CLEs that are specifically for active duty personnel, and that is actually something you have to put in your petition, that you either are or are not a member of the armed forces. And really, a lot of people will submit themselves to the court just to get the, you know, divorce over with and, and you know, work out something or whatever, or even have a hearing, submit to the hearing. But, um, but you get into issues about uh, residence. I mean, that's one big thing. Residence, you know, how are you going to serve somebody and have him come to court repeatedly month after month for a year? You can't do it. So a lot of times it's just put on hold. You know, it really, it's a case-by-case -case situation. Yes? Um, you said that debts were usually split 50-50. If one spouse is, like, self-employed, and a great deal of the debt is related to that self-employment. Will the other spouse still be responsible for half of that debt, even though? It would probably depend, and this gets a little more complicated, whether it was a corporation versus a, a sole, proprietorship. sole proprietorship. Because the reality is, and, and I guess you can do it in a corporation too, but if you're a sole proprietor, pretty much that money that is the company money is your money. I mean, it's, you're taxed on it immediately. So you're kind of paying the debts from all your marital money, and you are also taking that money straight out and using it. Probably depends on how it's structured. You know, that's what I would say. If it's tied up with the assets of the business, it'll be combined. So for example, uh, 
my law office has hardly any assets, but my fax machine and all that kind of stuff. If I had a loan for all those different things, I would presume that we'd consider the value of the business itself and that would go somewhere. And, and also, when we're talking about maintenance in the division of property and debt, you know, there's a, there's a difference between receiving a piece of property and receiving income producing property. So that is also considered when they're dividing it and when they are assigning maintenance. Because, uh, for example, if I'm, if I'm going to receive income producing property and I'm asking for maintenance, the judge is going to consider how much I'm, I'll be able to use out of that asset to support myself. Not to liquidate an asset, the judge doesn't consider that, but the income that is produced by the asset. So that would be kind of a business thing. How many of the cases in divorce are settled uh, outside of court? Uh, I know in Illinois they have a thing where they hired a former uh, chief justice of the family court, and there's a law firm that advertised that as a, uh, he would act as a mediator. As a, Mediator, I don't know what legal status they exactly have, but okay. what, is that a a large number of cases, small number of cases in Missouri? Well, actually, most cases in general probably settle, and I don't, you know, you say out of court, but it still ends up being in the court file with a court order. Um, I, you know, I do criminal as well, and most of those cases, almost all of those settle. We work something out. But with a domestic, I would say 90%. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, if you're asking how many are mediated, I don't know that we would know that. There are people who go to, to mediators and get it all resolved, then they have to put it into the court system. Right, right. And I don't, I don't know that we know how, how many, what and, percentage. And I, I would say, though, I would say at least 90% of divorce cases end up settling either by the attorney settling, the guardian being involved, or mediation. And I can tell you from a personal perspective, as an attorney, you know, I hate mediation cases. And the reason is, I mean, I like people to get along, but the reason is they're attorneys, okay? The mediators are attorneys. They come in, they're gonna charge them however much per hour. Then they call me on the phone, they say, can you file for my divorce? We've got it all worked out. And then I want you to look at the agreement and tell me if it's good or not. I don't know if it's good or not. If I don't have all that information that I would normally get with a case, so it's like you're getting double or triple billed. Although, you know, if it works for you, that's fine. I just, I have a difficulty taking those kinds of cases myself because I end up doing the same amount of work and my client expects that I shouldn't. But, you know, to protect myself and my client, I'm obligated to, to you know, make sure that it is a fair, fair settlement. Or that at least they know the pros and cons of it. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, you said earlier that uh, the woman has to swear that she's not pregnant. Does the man have to swear that he did not impregnate another woman in that year time period? Mm -hmm. Oh no, you're allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely allowed to do that. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I've had somebody uh, tell me that they wanted that they suspected two children to be, it belonged to her husband with two different women and she wanted to open paternity cases on them. I said, I'm sorry, but really you don't have the right to do that. That's between him and these other women if in fact they're his children. But no, uh, you don't have to swear to that, but believe me, it'll come out if anybody knows. So almost said it takes six months to one year to normally litigate. Mm -hmm. uh, what if it's uncontested and everybody's in agreement? Huh? Can you do it quicker? Yes, you can. As a matter of, um, I would say a few, and I have, I've had those kinds of cases where people come to me and say, my husband and I have figured it all out, we just need, and by the way, when they say we just need an attorney, one attorney can only represent one person. In other words, I can't go in and represent husband and wife, that's a conflict, because who, who am I going to side with when I say, hey, this doesn't look right? So um, they'll come to me and say, or, you know, well, somebody will come to me and say, would you please file this? We've got it figured out. And I'll tell them yes, and I'll also pretty much warn them that chances are it's not going to go as smoothly, smoothly as they think it will, and I'm just letting them know that it may all fall apart. And I would say most of those cases do fall apart because somebody decides that want a little more, you know, or want to give a little less. And I know somebody over here had the hand up. What's a legal separation? A legal separation basically is 
getting to the point of divorce but not taking that final step. And what the parties do is they actually work out all the, or work out or they have a hearing, either one, and they have all these details uh, in that s legal separation. Custody is determined, child support, maintenance, properties divided, attorney's fees are assigned. The difference is that after a period of time, and I'm thinking it's like 60 days or 90 days, I can't remember off the top of my head, either party can come back and say, okay, I want this to be a divorce. They file a motion to convert it to a divorce, and it's pretty difficult to stop that from happening. Some people do that, one, because of religious reasons, two, because they feel like there's a potential that the other spouse is going to straighten up in a period of time and they'll get back together. The third reason, which actually was a bigger reason a few years ago, was to, if you had a sick spouse, to keep them on health insurance, but the companies now have caught on to that, and if you're legally separated, will usually not allow you to remain on health insurance. Uh, because a lot of people were doing that with their incapacitated spouses. Can I say one thing? Sure. In the legal separation, you say that the marriage is not irretrievably broken. In the divorce petition, you say that it is irretrievably broken. And then like Diane said, you, you've, you've done the same thing. You've, you've done all your property, your custody, and everything. You can then convert it later at any time. Right. But it, it's not used very often anymore. Mm -mm. I've done a few, not many. Yes. Okay, now is that uh, 60 and 90 days for legal separation, is that carved in stone? Is that, is that the benchmark? Uh, there's, a, there's a minimum, whatever it is. There's okay. a minimum time. I think it's 90 days. It could be okay. 90. Three months. So, so, Three months, so what if, says. what if a couple has not uh, filed uh, anything like that, but they're separated, and 60 and 90 days has passed already? We, no, no, we no, don't no. have any common law anything. Uh, we don't have uh, common law uh, marriage here. We don't have... Uh, Oh, they married, but, uh, you don't have to be right. separated right. to get divorced. Uh -huh. Is that what you're asking? You do not have to be in two different homes no, no, to get married. divorced. Married. You can get divorced anytime after you're married. Then you separate. But uh, then you 60, don't need. Days right, but you don't need to do it. I guess the, the the thing is, you don't need to file for a legal separation to to get a divorce. You right. just file straight for divorce. And you don't have to be separated to file for divorce. But that, you know what, that's a know your judge kind of thing because yes. there are some judges that will in fact dismiss your case if you remain living in the same household. And those are really difficult cases for guardians. But you're not living in the same household. Then you can get divorced anytime you want. Okay. Some people are sleep, still sleeping in the same bed. And I'm telling you, <laughs> that's a real difficult case for a guardian because I've you done so much. We're gonna, I'm sure You're watching a mini law school. Coming up next, Leo Long discusses an introduction to bankruptcy. Leo Long, or Leonora Long, is a trial attorney with the United States Trustee Program for the U.S. Department of Justice. She's a special assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of Missouri, graduate of St. Louis University. In 2008, this is a big award she got. Um, she was awarded the Judge, Judge Robert E. Brower in Invocations in Bankruptcy Law Award by the Bankruptcy Practice Memorial Fund. And uh, Judge Brower is a bankruptcy lawyer. So welcome, Leo. Hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, I speak loudly enough, I don't know that I'm going to need the microphone, but if anybody can't hear me, just let me know. I'm thrilled to be here tonight. I'm here on my own behalf, although I have to say I have a terrific job, work one, for one of the best employers in the world, the U.S. government, and I have uh, one of the best law firms, the United States Department of Justice. And what we do in the little unit that I work for is bankruptcy law. Bankruptcy law is in the news. Who has not been reading articles or hearing something about recent changes or companies filing bankruptcy or something? It is just, it's very current, but it's also very old. Let's just start with the Constitution of the United States and uh, Philadelphia uh, Constitutional Convention. Our forefathers decided that the federal government should and could make uniform bankruptcy laws. 
That's how old bankruptcy has been around. And actually, it started in England a long time ago uh, in the 14th and 15th century. But in England, it was only available for traders. So if you had a business and your business was uh, not successful, you could file a bankruptcy. In the United States, they decided to expand that to include bankers, brokers, underwriters. Does any of that sound familiar to anybody now? <laughs> That's right. But about 1800, it was decided that bankruptcy law could be applicable to us regular folks as well. So we have uniform bankruptcy laws in the United States, and it is a federal law. I know that uh, Judge Wolf was here talking to you about the Missouri court system and the court system in general. And as you know, there are federal <coughs> laws and there are state laws. Bankruptcy judges are federal judges. And therefore, I appear in bankruptcy court in the Eagleton Courthouse that you will see is the big new courthouse downtown. And that's where bankruptcy happens. And I have to tell you, when I heard that I was following uh, divorce law, divorce, bankruptcy, is this, I thought, was the most depressing night. <laughs> and then I looked at the schedule, and it's not like criminal law is something out of Comedy Central. Workers' comp, any of the areas of law, actually law is a very emotional time in many people's lives. You don't file bankruptcy without having some uh, most people don't file bankruptcy without having some tragedy in their life, which can include medical problems, loss of job, or even back to those people who originally were uh, the uh, originally were the ones we focused bankruptcy for our business people, loss of business. We are a nation of entrepreneurs, right? We are founded by people who wanted to come here to make a fresh start. And still, that happens today. Well, when you're an entrepreneur, sometimes, I think for people named Carnegie, maybe Rockefeller, sometimes it's worked out great. Sometimes, not so good. Bankruptcy law is there for those times in your life or when your business opportunities have not been as successful as you might have planned. And it's premised on the concept of a fresh start. So we're going to talk about the principle of a fresh start. Now, how would you get a fresh start? Well, a long time ago, you could move. You could move to another country. You could move to another part of the country. <coughs> That's not working so good with the internet. Your creditors can find you. So what you want to do now is you want to look at the possibility of discharging your debts. And that discharge of your, your obligations is why people file bankruptcy. That's the ultimate end game, is to get a discharge of your current obligations. We'll talk a little bit more about that throughout the next uh, I'm going to try to make it a half an hour, but there is a lot to cover in bankruptcy, and I want to make uh, time for questions. The other thing is, it happens to people who don't pay their bills. You get calls and dunning letters, and credit, uh, the credit card company calls and tries to collect the debt. Bankruptcy stops that because you're going to eventually get a discharge in a successful bankruptcy <coughs> from your obligations. So the reason why people file bankruptcy is to get that discharge and to stop the collection of debt. So you want to have a discharge. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty good thing to me. I don't have to pay my bills, right? Who would think that sounds like a bad thing in theory? But the cost the benefit is this, the cost is full disclosure. Because what you have to do when you file bankruptcy is disclose everything you own and everybody you owe money to. Transparency. 
because where there's a benefit, society imposes a heavy penalty. Your disclosure in bankruptcy is under penalty of perjury. And when Nancy was explaining what I do, she indicated that I'm a special assistant US, US attorney. I am sometimes involved in cases where we criminally prosecute people for things that happen in bankruptcy cases. And this is the area where some people don't want to kind of make a full disclosure. So when you file bankruptcy, you file a petition, automatically those calls have to stop because it's like an injunction. Automatically they can't send you any more letters to try to collect that debt. But within a few days after filing bankruptcy, you have to disclose all your real estate, all your personal property. That includes every bank account, the cash in your pocket, the value of any um, car that you might own, the value of your jewelry, and you sign those schedules of your assets under penalty of perjury. <clears throat> now, um, when you do that, <coughs> we're going to talk about the fact that your creditors receive notice of your bankruptcy and they have the right to come in and examine whether there possibly are other assets that you have that you haven't disclosed. In my experience, some people like to keep their motorcycles, some people like to keep their diamond earrings, and that can lead to prosecution under federal law and uh, time in jail. So when you file bankruptcy, you sign these penalties, uh, statements and schedules under penalty perjury, you also say everybody you owe money to. You have secured obligations like your house and car that you might owe, uh, owe money to a bank, and you have unsecured obligations, generally your credit card debts. Now you're going to discharge just about everything. Who can think of something that might not be discharged in bankruptcy? Mm -hmm. Student loans, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Income taxes. Taxes, because who wrote the laws? Mm -hmm. The federal mm -hmm. government. <laughs> so you generally can't d uh, discharge <coughs> your taxes. You generally can't discharge your child support obligations your student loans, yes ma'am, we'll talk about that in a minute because that's very good. You can actually discharge your debt on your house if you don't want to live there anymore. If you want to keep your house, there's a way you can keep it. What do you think something else yeah, you might not? Your commercial account, you are self-employed. Well, if it's not in your name. If it's not in your name, but, but you, you might still be. Owner, but you have a name, then you get it. That's what I have. Okay. If you run a business and you have the business as a self-employed, you know, as a sole proprietorship, then the assets of that sole proprietorship do come into the bankruptcy. If you have a corporation, the value of the corporation comes into the bankruptcy and has to be disclosed. But another kind of debt that's not discharged is a debt that you might have incurred as a result of fraud willful and malicious conduct, generally things that people say, ooh, I don't think that's such a good idea. You didn't do right. You committed fraud. I'm not going to let you run into bankruptcy court and discharge the obligation. <laughs> so there are different kinds of bankruptcy, and I'm going to quickly run through a Chapter 7 kind of bankruptcy. It's a straight bankruptcy. It's liquidation. So what happens in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy? You come in, you file your petition, you disclose your assets, you disclose your liabilities. A trustee is appointed to your case. And that trustee is supposed to examine and see if you really do have a motorcycle that doesn't have an obligation on it, that maybe the credit the trustee can sell, he can sell a nice Harley for maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars, and distribute that money to your creditors pro rata. So your creditors have an opportunity to recover money if you have assets in a Chapter Seven kind of bankruptcy. I want to focus a little longer on a Chapter Thirteen. That Chapter 7 bankruptcy, you come in, you disclose your assets, you uh, are examined by a trustee, and within 60 days, well, actually about 90 days after you file, you theoretically could get your discharge. It's very quick. So the Chapter 7 is the quick discharge. There's another kind of bankruptcy that's been in the news a little more lately. 
Chapter 13 bankruptcy used to be called a wage earner plan. The difference between the fast discharge Chapter 7 and the, I'll call it slow discharge of Chapter 13 is that you want to keep your house. And the lady in front said, is it, you know, can I get rid of my house or the debt on my house? Can I get rid of it? Not if you want to keep it. We're going to run through actually an example that I think might help put this into perspective. If I have a house that's worth $120,000, and I know that's what it's worth because I, as the owner of that real estate, are considered really an expert on the value of my house under Missouri law. But you know, I had a little time when I didn't have it um, it quite so, all right, maybe I wanted to fix up the kitchen, and so I borrowed extra money, and maybe on that house, I actually owe $150,000. Now, maybe on that $150,000, I owe to the first bank $100,000. That first bank is fully secured because the amount that I owe to that first bank of $100,000 is less than what the house is worth, okay? But I needed to fix up my kitchen. I borrowed an extra uh, $50,000 from Easy Money Bank. <coughs> Easy money is owed $50,000. Some of easy money's claim is secured and some of it's unsecured. But if I want to keep my house in a Chapter 13 kind of bankruptcy, I have to pay both banks back the amount that I owe them. If I'm behind, Say, for example, I've always kept current on my amount due to First Bank. If I am behind to easy money, in a Chapter 13 kind of bankruptcy, I can repay that arrearage. Say I'm six months behind on my house payment to easy money. I can repay that six months, that arrearage, over time in a Chapter 13. And that's why people who want to keep their house even if they're being foreclosed on, will file bankruptcy because that Chapter 13 bankruptcy can go from generally 36 to 60 months. And that's the period of time over which you can repay that arrearage. Plus, you pay more money. Generally, you look at what your income is and what your expenses are. And you file a plan with the court that says, I'm going to repay my six months arrearage to easy money over time, and then I'm going to pay an additional $200 a month to go to all my other creditors. And at the end of the 36 to 60 months plan, <coughs> then you get your discharge. Why do you want to do that? You don't want to give up your house. You're behind in your car, another secured obligation, same thing. Change the figures and, um, you know, the car is going to be worth less money. But what's all the recent talk about um, cram down of mortgages and a bankruptcy? We have to change our example a little bit and then we're right there. Let's make this 120000 and let's make this 30. In a bankruptcy case, in a chapter 13, you can't modify the uh, rights of the secure creditor. You have to repay them 100% on your residence. And that's what they're trying to change the law so that if, so that you can, uh, modify the rights of this holder of the second deed of trust saying my house isn't worth 
anything. And this guy, Easy Money, is an unsecured creditor because my house is only worth 120. I already owe 120. Easy Money is owed 30,000. Easy Money is an unsecured creditor. Currently in the bankruptcy law, you still have to pay Easy Money as a secured creditor. What they want to do is change the law. There's a, a, a suggestion to t potentially change the law so that easy money would not be paid. And actually, my example isn't perfect uh, because um, of a little glitch in the law. I apologize. Um, currently, if easy money is completely unsecured, you can modify that mortgage. So I apologize. My, I should have looked at my notes. My numbers are a little off. Uh, it should have been 130 and 20. OK. <coughs> because easy money is totally unsecured, they can be modified. But the first bank, you owe 130000 the house is only worth 120. You still have to repay the whole amount. Okay, if any, is anybody confused about that? A little bit of confusion? Let me go over it again. The, the suggestion to change the law is so that you can change the amount that you owe to your, uns, your secure creditor, your bank, to be equal to the amount of the value on your house. Your house is only worth $120,000, that's your fair market value, so you would only have to pay your bank $120,000, even though you owe the bank $130,000, because your house has gone down in value. That was not a circumstance that happened very often in St. Louis until the last couple years. Most people's value didn't go down, but rather went up. So they want to change the law to allow you to only repay a smaller amount to your mortgage company. Now, an important component of Chapter 13 is that there are certain kinds of debts you can stretch out over time. Taxes, they aren't dischargeable in the Chapter 7 kind of bankruptcy, but in a Chapter 13 where you have a plan that covers 36 to 60 months, you can stretch out your taxes. If you owe $5,000 in taxes, generally you can stretch out your payment in a Chapter 13. And that's why people want to file a Chapter 13. Now, um, I want to talk for a minute about Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is generally for businesses. And the concept is to allow the business to stay in business and come up with a plan to repay the creditors so that the employees can keep their job and the people who own shares in that company can keep possibly their value in that company depending on the circumstances. Chapter 11 can also result in though an orderly liquidation of an entity. Yeah? What happens to the unsecured $20,000 if the change goes through? If the change goes through, it's an unsecured debt. Gone. Well, it's an unsecured debt. And in a Chapter 13, what would happen is you would pay it like you would pay all your credit card debt. Because they, even though they had a lien on your house, arguably you would have to file a motion the mo or the lawsuit in the bankruptcy and say that that $20,000 was no longer a secured debt you would have it declared an unsecured debt by bringing in value to your real estate, uh, evidence of value of your real estate. So if the law is not changed, you still have to pay that $20,000 mortgage just like it is today. Yeah? Just, just to clarify then, you, you had originally the extra $200 that you were paying toward your unsecured debts. Right. Does that just stop at 36 to 60 months, or is that, are those debts satisfied? Do you 
you pay the full amount or you just pay that amount? Say, for example, you owed $40,000 to your, uh, to various credit card companies. The $200 a month times 60 is less than that amount. <laughs> I'm not doing the math as fast as I should. Pardon me? Oh, okay, well, I'll repeat the questions. The question is, um, if you're paying the $200 a month, what happens if this $20,000 goes away, right? The answer is the $200 per month for the 36 or 60 months goes to pay all your unsecured creditors and the rest of the amount is discharged. So that if you have $40,000 worth of credit card debt and under your Chapter 13 plan, which is approved, you're paying your unsecured creditors $200 a month. We're gonna forget for a minute that you're gonna keep current on this and you're gonna pay your arrearage over the 36 months. That $200 is for unsecured creditors and when you finish paying that off, the rest of your debts are discharged. There are a few more, it's, it's actually more complicated than that. Um, there's a, a, a priority of who you pay first and of course taxes are paid first and that arrearage on your home is paid uh, in advance. But generally, much of your unsecured debt might be discharged in a Chapter 13 kind of bankruptcy. Yeah. In a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, do you continue to pay the uh, creditors continue to charge you interest? No. The interest it's stops. Frozen. The interest is on your credit card kind of debt. debt. That's frozen and the you only pay the sum that you owe. The amount you owe on the day you file is what you owe. <coughs> yes, in the back. Yeah, I'm not the company getting a that's a very good question and I'll repeat it his the company he receives from whom he from which he receives a pension is going through a chapter 11 kind of bankruptcy right now what happens to his pension there's not an easy answer on that um, it's there are many chapter 11 bankruptcies that your pension is not affected and without knowing what the circumstance is, the, uh, it's not appropriate for me to comment on it. Um, generally, the pension is a completely separate legal entity and would not be, uh, your <coughs> ongoing pension may not be modified, but it depends on what happens in the Chapter 11 proceeding. Until the judge uh, has a motion in front of him, you, it's likely you would continue to receive your pension. I, can't, I don't know whether your pension's fully funded or what the circumstance is with regard to your pension or what's going to happen in the Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So there are a lot of circumstances and there are a lot of people uh, in your same circumstance, I'm sure. Sometimes the uh, people who are receiving a pension can get together and have a, a, a committee, an uh, informal committee so that you don't have to hire a lawyer on your own and that sometimes is the best thing for people who are receiving a pen pension in a bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, in your first example with the easy bank where you right. put, um, the debt bank, debt loan represent a second mortgage or a home equity loan or what was it? Could have been a second mortgage, could have been a home equity loan. I'm glad you answered it that way. Okay, now the debt doesn't matter. Who would want that law to go into effect? Why would you want to change that law so that that can be forgiven or whatever? Wouldn't that make it harder for people to get that type of loan? Wouldn't companies stop them get into that business if, if it could be wiped out like that? You know, it's funny because that used to be the circumstance um, prior to the change of the law in 2005. So some people are saying you'd go back to where how it was before. But it's a policy decision, not mine to decide. Um, I want to co cover a couple of other things before we just stop and take more questions. Um, again, with regard to criminal law, what's illegal? Not disclosing the stuff you have. Or filing a false proof of claim. If I decided that I wanted money from uh, 
the debtor who, re who filed bankruptcy and I filed a false proof of claim, I can be indicted because it's against, it's against federal law to file a false claim in the bankruptcy court. But more likely, people are being indicted regularly for failing to disclose their assets, failing to disclose things they want to keep because they didn't want to accept the burden that comes with the benefit of filing bankruptcy. Yes, sir, in the back. How many times? Yes. Well, generally you can file once every eight years. Chapter 11. There are companies that have filed Chapter 11 a number of different times, but a corporation um, is going to, when they come out of bankruptcy, say a company files a bankruptcy uh, in 2005 <laughs> and they come out of a bankruptcy in 2006 and it's a corporation, their circumstances may have changed and they may file a bankruptcy again in 2009 and they may have a successful reorganization again in 2009. And there are bankruptcies where creditors are paid 100 cents on the dollar in the Chapter 11 world. In the last 13. Chapter 13, well, you can only get a discharge every six years. There's this question in front. Yeah, does that go for uh, your own company that you had under the LLC? Anything uh, well, a company that you have under an LLC, how often can you file a bankruptcy for them? If you're going to file a Chapter 7 kind of bankruptcy and the company goes completely out of business, it doesn't exist anymore and you can't refile for that same business. An individual can file every eight years, an individual can get a discharge every eight years. Yes? I would presume that the uh Second holder of the loan uh, that you're talking about on the board uh, was actually fraudulently you know, giving that loan out in the first place. Okay, so the question is there was fraud with easy money. Okay, I'll put easy money back up here. So easy money is the subject of a lot of discussion. So that may be why, you know, uh, the law needs to be changed in order to protect the consumer uh, because we're already paying enough to get out of debt these uh, players, all of them from the top down, within the banking and lending institutions in this country. And it lessens the burden on the individual to pay back two or three times because we're already getting tax dollars. And then they're asking us to higher interest rates. And they're going to come back and say, I had to pay this debt, which was never worth the amount. And we knew it all along. Your house wasn't worth the amount. But we gave you the loan. So is there, okay, uh, I don't know that there's a question, I think there was a comment as to sometimes this easy money obligation was incurred as a result of wrongdoing by the lender. And so I think that the comment was that that might be a reason why you'd want to change the law. I think it's a policy decision um, that's a, definitely a, a, it's a bill before Congress in the back. Um, you know, going with that, I guess, I mean, I, I'm curious as to either either side of that, whether the person who signs the contract, knowing that it's not worth that amount of money, could they be prosecuted for fraud, or the, the mortgage company who then says it's worth that amount of money could be prosecuted for fraud? That's not an aspect of bankruptcy law, but I think what you're saying is what is the law with regard to uh, someone who has committed loan fraud with a federal institution? And there clearly are federal laws that uh, criminal laws against filing false loan or preparing false loan applications and people are prosecuted for mortgage fraud on both sides of the transaction all the time. I think there was an announcement today um, that there was a, a mortgage fraud Ponzi scheme that was being indicted um, and uh, there was something in the news that I heard on the way over. So both sides of the transaction there are laws that require um, full disclosure. There's uh, truth in lending laws, which I'm not a, a specialist on that. But then also, there are many people, and I think they, you know, there are people who filed, they're called no document loans. Mm -hmm. People who filed bankruptcy having gotten that obligation and didn't have to provide any documents, but they falsified their income. <laughs> 
So they may have received an, a loan for a house that they really couldn't have afforded if they had disclosed the full, uh, the actual amount that they uh, earned and if they had disclosed the full amount of uh, their credit card obligations. And because they didn't disclose everything, they got a loan or qualified for a loan that was significantly more than they would have had they made their full disclosures. So there's some fraud sometimes on either side of the deal. Uh, yeah, we have another also, question up front uh, first. That comment that also the lender, <coughs> lenders mm -hmm. should be held to a higher standard because they're in the business as far as I'm concerned. And in terms of um, who's, who's more fraudulently acting uh, and should never have accepted no uh, doc loans in the first place. There should be some punishment for that. Uh, just an, an editorial comment that there should be punishment for uh, people who uh, had developed a system of no document loans. In the back. Well, so that amount, if it's considered a judgment then because of the fund they would not be able to have that discharge. Well, uh, someone has to establish that the obligation was a result of fraud. Separately? In a separate, yeah, actually almost like a mini lawsuit in the bankruptcy. Yes? Um, the question has to do with taxes, okay? Taxes, yeah. Is, in Chapter 7, weren't there some conditions where that is discharge of bankruptcy? Absolutely. And you have to consult with your bankruptcy professional with regard to whether your kind of taxes are dischargeable or not. That's federal and state. Yes. Okay. But, but it's not totally undischargeable. Generally. And I think I did say generally yes. dischargeable. Right. And, uh, yeah. But if you don't make that clear, because I know of a person who got their taxes discharged because it was over three years from day of assessment by the federal government was discharged. Federal. They generally are not discharged, but there are some circumstances. And so dates of assessment um, and other particularities with regard to whether there was a, a whether they filed the return or not uh, all come into play. It's a question in the back. Yes, ma'am. Is there a minimum amount of debt that a person has to have to file Chapter 13 or Chapter 7? There's no minimum. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to use that discharge uh, unless it's really, uh, it's really important. And that's why consulting with somebody who is you know, a lawyer who's trained in bankruptcy and knows uh, what um, may, uh, is able to give you advice about what may be in your best interest is a good idea. Now, on the other side of it, you're talking about whether there's a minimum of debt a few years ago, they changed the bankruptcy law to uh, include more information in those papers that you file about your income and your expenses. Because the sense was that people with pretty high income who are able to repay their debts in a Chapter 13, possibly, for 36 to 60 months were filing Chapter 7 bankruptcy. So now we, you have to disclose more income information and more expense information, and they do a, an analysis. And if you pass, it, and under the income and expense analysis, if you make enough money that you could repay your debts in a Chapter 13, then there can be a motion to dismiss your case by the trustee, and you might be required to either dismiss your case or file a Chapter 13. Yes, sir. In, in uh, Chapter 11, the courts could rule that contracts of business ventured in with unions or anyone mm -hmm. else could be eliminated or modified. Could it, and my question is paralleling that, with a personal bankruptcy, would contracts of your God had made a legal contract to expand your house, but now you're a bankruptcy, is that? Eliminate those, or could the court, could the court eliminate those contracts? The question is twofold. The question is in a Chapter 11, what happens to contracts? And then in a personal bankruptcy, what happens to your obligations? I think we'll get into that in a minute. But first, let's focus on the Chapter 11 kind of bankruptcy and what happens to contracts. Say you own a clothing uh, retail sales business and you have 
retail stores in 30 malls throughout the country. And you, uh, your company, uh, let's call it uh, the dress store. The dress stores in 30 malls throughout the country files a Chapter 11 kind of bankruptcy. There are particular statutes that allow you to reject some of those contracts if you choose to reject them so that you don't you can break your lease in a bankruptcy you can reject that kind of uh, contract so that perhaps you only want to be in 10 retail outlets so frequently in a chapter 11 the debtor is making an analysis of what are some of the good leases and what are the performing leases and what are some of the properties that they think it'd be better to not be in that mall anymore now, your second part of your question was, what about in a personal bankruptcy? First, let me be clear. Chapter 11 can be filed by an individual. I said generally, and you're right. Generally is a, is a vague term, and um, it's a qualifier. Generally, Chapter 11 is for businesses. It's an expensive thing to do. You have to pay uh, a lawyer generally to represent you. And it goes on for a period of time, and the kind of plan you put forth in the Chapter 11 is very complicated. So you can, as an individual, file a Chapter 11, <coughs> although most people who file a Chapter 11 as an individual have some kind of business that they're trying, or business dealings that they're trying to <coughs> work through. Um, with regard to the Chapter 7 liquidation kind of bankruptcy, you can walk away from your contracts, you can reject your contracts, you can turn your leased car back in and reject that lease. Of course, you still have to have something to drive. So, some people in a Chapter 7 straight kind of bankruptcy choose to continue on and continue to be current on the lease of that vehicle because they still have to have something to drive. Yep. What is a homestand? Homestead, okay. Now, about half an hour ago, we talked about uh, in your filing a Chapter 7 kind of bankruptcy, that straight liquidation, the question is, what is a homestead in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy? And I think the question is getting at this, and you tell me if I'm answering the wrong question. Um, what do you get to keep with regard to your interest in your house? Okay. Missouri law allows you to keep $15,000 worth of equity in your house. So, if you file a Chapter 7 kind of bankruptcy and you have a house worth $120,000, if you owe one hundred and fifty, dollars that trustee is never going to try to sell that house because the house is not worth as much. He's going to sell the house for 120. dollars He'd have to pay the bank the $150,000, right? So the trustee in the bankruptcy case in the Chapter 7 isn't going to try to sell your house. You might want to keep your house, so you might say, I'm going to keep current on this mortgage to the bank, to First Bank, because I want to keep my house. Now, if your house is worth one hundred and twenty. dollars and you only owed $50,000 on that house. That trustee who was going to sell your Harley, I didn't mean to pick on you in front, sir. I don't know if you have a Harley or not. But that trustee who was going to sell your Harley or your diamond ear bobs, earrings, um, would say, well, I could sell that house for $120,000. I could pay First Bank $50,000 and I would have $70,000 to distribute to your creditors. Missouri says the first $15,000 is the equity you get to keep in your house. And even though I said bankruptcy is uniform laws, one of the uniform laws is that every state gets to decide how much their citizens get to keep of their stuff. Because nobody files bankruptcy and has to give up every jacket and every pair of shoes and the trustee has a big garage sale. So you all get to keep, well, not you all, people who file bankruptcy get to keep some reasonable amount of stuff. 
and the Missouri, uh, the people who make the laws in Missouri, the Missouri legislature, has said you get to keep $15,000. So your house is worth 120, <coughs> you owe 50, you'd sell it, the trustee would get $70,000. He'd give you 15. Now, this is a case where you might not want to file bankruptcy because mm -hmm. the trustee is going to want to sell your house. So that's why, as I think one of my earlier comments with regard to your very good question on taxes was bankruptcy is the kind of complicated situation even for people who seem to have a relatively easy circumstance. I just know some credit card bills. But you don't want to lose your house. If your goal is to keep your house, uh, a lawyer who knows bankruptcy can help you assess what your options might be. Yes? Um, what's the feasibility or the occurrences uh, that are possible, like somebody who wants to discharge their debt and maybe um, has a claim against them where they're in a court situation and uh, there's a judgment even, and they end up saying, I'm going to file bankruptcy, and then everybody gets a notice to say they're filing bankruptcy, and then they decide to try to get the, uh, uh, what we can call it, a, I guess a dismissal without prejudice or something from the court. Is that possible, or does that happen in order to avoid paying off any? A lot of times, people, the reason why people file bankruptcy have to do with the fact that they're embroiled in some kind of lawsuit, and that does in fact happen. And whether the underlying obligation is discharged in bankruptcy or not can turn on the facts of what is the nature of the underlying bankruptcy. Um, if somebody's just, if your credit card company is just suing you uh, just because you're behind in paying the credit card, and you've got a, an action in a small claims court, or maybe they have a, you know, a local state court action, and you file bankruptcy, that obligation can generally be discharged. There's my word again, generally. <laughs> if you've committed fraud, the, uh, more, uh, the uh, credit card company might come in and say your debt's not dischargeable. And there are some other little, some laws that are particular to uh, <laughs> buying some luxury goods shortly before bankruptcy and other things, but uh, we don't need to get into those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it varies from state to state and frankly that's not my area because you know bankruptcy we don't really deal with statutes of limitations but my recollection is for 10 years depending on the nature of the obligation but frankly in other words, if you want to make a claim in court and it's uh, eight or a ten year old debt, you can still do that. If you can debt. Well, they may then object to your claim, saying that it's not uh, that you couldn't sue on it, and I think that might turn on the particular state law. Okay. Well, I uh, want to just explain too that there are particular bankruptcy judges who only deal with bankruptcy cases. They're experts in the area of bankruptcy. Um, but uh, the importance of filing your bankruptcy case should come only after long contemplative reflection about what's in your best interest and talking to a bankruptcy professional. Before you file bankruptcy, one of the other changes in the law is that you had to go to a, you have to now go to credit counseling before you can file bankruptcy. Once you file a bankruptcy, before you get your discharge, you have to go to debtor education. Credit counseling will look at your particular situation and say, you might be able to repay some of your creditors uh, over time outside of bankruptcy, or you know, uh, maybe you need to go see a bankruptcy lawyer. The purpose of debtor education is to tell you, let's do a little budget. Let's see whether, perhaps if you cut down some of your expenses, you can live uh, within your income level and perhaps not fall back in that situation again. Yes, sir? <clears throat> if uh, your name is on a credit card uh, just as a user, and the person who signs for the credit card goes bankrupt. Are you liable for what you used on that credit card? Whether they file bankruptcy or not, your liability is the same. Repeat the question. I apologize. She did tell me to do that. Uh, if you if you are obligated on a credit card and somebody files bankruptcy, do you still need to pay on the credit card? The answer is 
you are, whatever your obligation is, bankruptcy doesn't change the obligation of the, uh, the person who, if you were never obligated on the card, you just were, uh, you know. Uh, I was able to use it. It was a corporation, and the corporation went bankrupt. Okay. And now American Express is coming after me because I used the card. In the meantime, it was you know, for business purposes. But since the corporation went bankrupt, am I liable for that debt? Again, bankruptcy doesn't affect whether you are individually liable or not. If you're individually liable before, then you're individually liable after. The fact that a company's filed bankruptcy doesn't really change that liability. And I will say that just because a company's gone out of business doesn't mean they filed bankruptcy. You can always check with the bankruptcy court. Um, you can uh, use a, a number, number of different searches, but you can check with the bankruptcy court, generally in the area where they did business. Sometimes corporations file in Delaware or Southern District of New York, but uh, not everybody files bankruptcy just because they've gone out of business. That's something to keep in mind. Any further or last questions? Yeah, in the back. Well, here's the circumstance. That goes on your credit report, the fact that you filed bankruptcy. And that's one of the factors that is considered by companies who extend credit. They don't have to extend credit to you. Um, you aren't necessarily automatically denied. And there are people who, uh, if you file that Chapter 7 straight kind of bankruptcy <laughs> that we talked about, you're able to file once every eight years. There are people who say you're a better credit risk because you can't file again, but they may charge you a higher interest rate. So that's just one of their factors in determining whether they want to extend your credit as to whether you filed bankruptcy previously. Yeah. Can you trust those companies that are offering you uh, new start, getting in new start, even if you went bankrupt? Can you trust those people like I, leadership started that? I think in any circumstance, you have to use your reasonable judgment. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If it sounds too good to be true, it might not be. Um, but you know, as to whether it's a good uh, circumstance for you personally or not, I, I can't say. <coughs> been a pleasure. I hope I didn't confuse you too much with regard to my numbers. Thank you.